Sorry about that. Good morning, First Christian Church. We had someone stop by, Butch Kitt stopped by this week. I missed him at the office, but they had made this really innovative sign that I thought was so interesting. You know, we love our church, First Christian Church, because good Bible teaching, Holy Spirit-filled, diversified programs, insightful sermons, Sunday school classes, loving congregation, old gospel hymns, everyone is welcome, and exciting children's programs. You know, this is uh, something that he had, and his wife had made, Sherry, and, and thanks, Butch, for bringing this back by the church. We'll certainly put this up and try and remind ourselves of what church needs to be all about. Also want to mention just a few announcements real fast this morning. We are starting some in-person experiences for folks that are interested in doing that. We have in-person Bible study on Thursday mornings at 10 a.m. in our fellowship hall, and Elizabeth is hosting those events, so you're welcome to come by and be a part of that. They have plenty of room for social distancing, and I think everyone is wearing, everyone is wearing their masks, so it's a pretty safe environment. Also... Uh, for the first time, we had our Wednesday evening programming, so we had some children's activities out here in the yard where the kids could play games and uh, be appropriate in their social distancing. And the adults, uh, we met actually on the front sidewalk of the church and had our first adult Bible study, which was very nice. Um, we're also having our first in-person youth event today, so I want to remind any parents uh, of youth that we're meeting over at Aaron's house right after worship today for some time to enjoy fellowship in the yard, and we'll also be having social distancing and wearing masks. So you can certainly uh, put in your mind that if you're interested in beginning the process of coming back, we are trying very hard to be very safe and also, when possible, to always just meet outside, and we've had great weather. And speaking of outside, this morning we had a really wonderful casual worship in the yard. The weather was absolutely perfect. So uh, also want to encourage anyone, if your schedule is allowing you to come, 945, we have folks that stay in their cars for car worship. We also have folks that gather in lawn chairs that they bring for worship around the communion table in our yard. So several lot things happening. We'd love to have you be a part of them. But anyways, today's message is um, one that you might be familiar with, and the, the sermon title today is Wine, 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 Complain, 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 and no, I'm not going to be the one trying to do that, but if there's one thing for certain, if you put a bunch of youth on a church bus on a mission ex experience, and you take them off who knows where, there is going to be some whining and complaining. Sometimes adverse conditions can bring out the worst in us, and certainly today we're going to find out as the Israelites are in some difficult conditions, they're going to go to their default mode of whining and complaining. So we're going to kind of see what happens when we whine and complain, and certainly there's been plenty of opportunities for that to happen as we've been through this COVID-19 pandemic as a nation. So let's take a look at our complaining. Let's think a little bit about our whining, and let's see how God can help us with that situation. And let's worship together this morning. Please join us in singing, This is the Day. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice. And be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Will you join us in our call to worship this morning? We come today to seek your spirit. Your spirit enables us to live a life of humility. Our faith leads us to show generosity to God. Your amazing grace lifted us and we are thankful. Let us never fall into the fallacy of the Pharisees who thought higher of themselves than of others. 
Let us instead follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Let us walk humbly with our God, showing hospitality to the strangers and kindness to the needy. Let us worship God. And let us worship God through song. Our opening song today is, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. the prayer our Lord taught us how to pray. And so would you pray with me? Our Father, Father who, who art, art in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead, and lead us not into temptation, temptation but, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the, and the glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Good morning. I'd like to ask all the children to pay careful attention. We're going to have our own special children's moments here. And I brought some things to share with you. Let me get ready. You know, when we go upstairs to chapel together, which we haven't been able to do in a while, um, and hopefully we will be able to one day soon. But we usually have a piece of the desert with us when we're talking about the desert. So I went and got me a piece of desert here so that we could set the tone. Um, it's always important to kind of feel like you know where you are. We've been talking about Moses. We talked about him several times lately. And one thing that we um, learned was that, of course, we know that when he was born, what an interesting birth he had. And his mother had to hide him so he would survive. We know that God called him at one point to go back into Egypt and, and get his people, get God's people out of Egypt. And that was quite a little tuggle with um, Pharaoh there. And so the people did leave. They were ready and they left. 
And they were able to go pass through the waters and escape from Pharaoh's army, which was pretty scary, I'm sure. And they got out into the desert and like, oh boy, here we are. And then, of course, they realized it was going to be a harder journey than they probably could have ever imagined. It's, it's always hard to imagine what's next um, in this thing. So um, at one point, you know, God had to teach them some lessons, and he did that all during this journey. And one lesson he had to teach them was that he was going to take care of them. So one way he did that is they were traveling. You know, they left. They didn't bring everything with them, and they weren't on a road a uh, McDonald's along the way or someplace they could stop, um, a Kroger's where they could stop and buy provisions. So they were kind of out there with what little they had. And so God was trying to teach them that, yes, he was going to take care of them. And so he had told them that he was going to provide them with nourishment. And this nourishment didn't come in the form of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or anything that they were used to. They wouldn't have had that either, I suppose. But, um, but it came in the form of manna. And manna was very simple, and it was white. And you think, well, how could you live on that very long? Um, but it had everything they needed. God knew what they needed, and he was taking care of them. Now, I have a bowl here, and um, it doesn't have manna in it because I don't have any real manna because I wasn't there. Um, but I have popcorn, and popcorn kind of was white and kind of reminded me. Um, and so when they would wake up in the morning, the manna would be sprinkled on the ground. And when the dew left and rose, there was the manna. Now, God provided it, and there it was, but they had to go pick it up. He didn't deliver a bag of manna to each door, so all they had to do was eat it. They had to go get it, and so they went out, and they had to collect it and pick it up. Now, the reason I have this particular size bowl, God told them how much to get, and I went back and looked up what that was, and I tried to figure out what that would be in our terms, and, and um, that would equates to about half a gallon. So I found a bowl that actually is half a gallon size. And so that means that every day if I was there, I could have gone out and picked up, I had to go around and pick it up and put it in my bowl. But God had said, you can only get this much. So if I had the right size container, that would be real easy. I would know I can get this much and that has to last me all day. This is my provisions for the day. And if I ate it all up right away, then I just didn't have any till tomorrow. I think we've all tried that trick before, and that, then we get hungry. Um, some people, you know, we all know that there was somebody who went, I'm going to collect like three bowls full, okay, and take it home with me. God told them not to do that, that it wouldn't last, it would get wormy. Don't want to eat wormy stuff, right? So I'm sure somebody tried that. It didn't work out too well, and they learned their lesson. But you know, on, on the Sabbath, they were not allowed to go out and pick any up. So the day before that, they were allowed to get enough for two days. And it didn't get moldy at night. Isn't that amazing? God took care of all of that. So they had their bowl per person. This bowl didn't have to do my whole family. It was for me, okay? So each person in your family was allowed half a gallon, so to speak. So that's what kept them alive. That's what kept them going. Now, I think God was trying to teach them a couple things. I'm going to take care of you. And he does take care of us in so many ways. And I need you to go do your part. I need you to pick up your half gallon of manna and I need you to use it today and don't save it till tomorrow. So the people who pay attention to that right away probably had more success right away. Something to learn. So as we close today I want us to remember two important things. A, God's going to take care of you. When he says he's going to do it, he does it. He said he was going to provide for them. He did. Isn't that cool? And he took care of them. And the second thing is, he needs us to follow his direction. He needs us to do what he asks. That simple. So, when we figure out what that is, that's what we need to do. We need to do our part. Okay? God needs us to do our part. 
So before we finish today, let's have a prayer together. So will you bow your heads and pray with me, please? Dear God, thank you so much for taking care of us. Thank you for giving us directions to follow. And Lord, remind us to do our part to do the things that you need us to do. Amen. Good morning. Our scripture this morning is from the book of Exodus, chapter 16, verses 2 through 15. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that, we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and you fill your bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. May God bless the reading of his word. Well, good morning. This morning's uh, message comes from the Old Testament, and it is a famous message because it involves a lot of whining and complaining. And certainly, we are not ones who have not had a lot of that going on in our nation, maybe during these times of COVID-19. In this story, the Israelites, as we know, are on this journey. They've been able to get out of Egypt, and they've been able to pass through the Sea of Reeds, and they've come into an oasis where they spent some period of time. And this is about a month later after they've left that oasis in Elim, and now they're moving out into the Sinai wilderness that we know fairly well in our imaginations because later it is the site of Jesus as he goes out into this wilderness to be tempted by Satan. This is a famous passage because in just 14 sentences, the, the people figure out how to whine and complain seven times. So there's a whole lot of whining and complaining. And I think historically, we can 
listen to a story like this and think, well, they were in this wilderness, and at least where we live here in the western side of Virginia, we have lush, beautiful woods. We don't tend to really relate in our minds to a wilderness type of experience. But for anyone who's been out west, maybe to Arizona, as my family's been blessed to do, we got out there and we're pretty amazed that there's no trees and that it's a very bleak um, landscape everywhere. And so this is certainly the setting for this story historically. But even for those of us that have never been out in a desert like that, I think we have the opportunity to understand the heart of what this story is saying. And for me, uh, the first experience with that really happened 20 years ago. And it was kind of an interesting thing that happened. There was this national phenomenon. Everyone was talking about a TV show. And I'm not really a big TV watcher, so, um, you know, I, I just kind of hear what people are talking about in the hallways, but you just kept hearing about this TV show. And so under kind of a funny uh, opportunity, I ended up hosting the, um, a party at my house to kind of for the very end of this TV show. And we all watched with, uh, you know, this angst and anxiety about who was going to win this very first season and, of course, the, the movie, the TV show I'm talking about is Survivor. And this was back in 2000 during season one when Richard Hatch won Survivor. And we were all amazed that this guy had out-survived all of his rivals. Well, what we learned from watching that season of Survivor and then all the other seasons that followed is that when you put people out either in a wilderness or in a jungle or anywhere in between, and you really don't give them all the creature comforts we're used to. Maybe they don't get all the food they want, or maybe not much food at all. Maybe they're living in tents. People start to whine and complain. They also start to turn on one another, and, you know, they start backstabbing each other. And so we watched on national television as all these survivor contestants started voting one another out, saying hateful comments, just generally making a nuisance of themselves because they were hungry and they were tired and they didn't really have all the clothes to wear they wanted and they were probably itching from all sorts of bugs and everything else. So this is not a story that we can't understand. Matter of fact, I think the Survivor Series is, you know, continued all these seasons because there's something about us that loves watching people in miserable situations whine and complain. I'll bring this story even closer to home. We have a special outdoor church camp program here at First Christian Church we call Trek Camp. And we sort of invented this as an opportunity for our young people to have some high adventure experiences. And we work through our local Boy Scout chapter to provide the kids with opportunities to go whitewater rafting and canoeing, rock climbing, repelling, all sorts of other uh, opportunities and experiences. But the one thing that surprised me when we first started working with Camp Palatam was that they didn't have a backpacking experience woven into the New River Venture program. So I got talking with them about it, and they said, oh, well, that's a, that's a different program. And I said, I really just feel like I, I'd like to have the kids do some backpacking. Not because the youth were all excited about doing any backpacking, but probably more because I knew there was things that could be learned in a backpacking trip that can't be learned other ways. And so as we would be out there hiking with the young people, uh, certainly there were plenty of opportunities for them to complain and have a fit about being hungry and being tired and having to sleep in tents. And you know, when the young people were out there in the woods, maybe we're out on a campsite and it's raining, I think all the, all the youth are saying to themselves, golly, at least at home I've got a dry bed. At least at home I've got food to eat. Uh, at least where, you know, before this silly trek camp started, I was like dry and warm. And, you know, we see the same thing happen today with the Israelites. They actually, in their minds, they, they refer back to their time in Egypt. And it, it's really amazing that they reference back to this time when they had enough food but they were enslaved. And they actually look upon that time with, you know, positive vibes because of the situation they find themselves in the wilderness, free and yet struggling and hungry versus someone who's in a situation when they're enslaved but they have enough food to eat. 
you know, um, we refer to that sort of scenario as nostalgia. And I think this passage is a really good example of how we have to be cautious of the ways that we remember and the ways that we in integrate nostalgia into our lives. We're certainly seeing that happening right now as we come through half a year of the situation with COVID-19. And just this past week, I was uh, in a, on a sidewalk right next to our sanctuary with some adults, and we were having a Bible study. And, and I remember we all kind of looked over at one point. We looked over at the sanctuary building, and I said, oh, for the days that we were gathered in that beautiful sanctuary. And uh, everyone just nodded their heads, right, a nostalgia. But, you know, we, when we say that, we're, we're weaving, uh, we're doing a careful weaving of our memories because, you know, there's a lot of times that the sanctuary actually didn't have a lot of people because they didn't want to come to church and sit in a sanctuary. And sometimes our sanctuary could be very noisy with people wandering around. And we've actually looked uh, pretty extensively about renovations to our sanctuary. So, you know, we're looking at this sanctuary and we're saying, oh, remember when uh, we could gather in that wonderful sanctuary. And yet a lot of times we chose in those moments uh, not to gather in that sanctuary. You know, I'm a, I'm a person that's, uh, I love hugs, and I'm a big, I'm a big hugger as a, as a way of showing affirmation and support to a brother or sister. And certainly, this is something that we're not doing uh, because of COVID-19. And it's been interesting to have people talk about that, because people say, oh, you know, we could get together, and we would just be giving each other hugs, and it was just such a great experience before COVID-19. And yet, um, I think, and I'm looking at these groups, and I'm going, actually, there's people in this group that are not huggers. Like, I wouldn't hug them, and they wouldn't hug me, and they liked it that way. Not everyone wants someone in your space. So we, we look back with nostalgia, how we could give each other hugs when some of us never really wanted a hug. That's just not the way we want to show fellowship or hospitality. So it's, it's easy for us to be people who are living in a nostalgia past. It's easy for us to be people that are backward looking. It's easy for the Israelites to actually reference slavery. To be slaves was a preference to this opportunity God was providing for them to be free. So I think the first simple lesson of today's you know, message is really to be people who are forward looking and to remember that our memories can betray us. So often the past is such a grand experience because we homogenize some of the difficulties and challenges that we faced in our past. So I want to encourage us to be people who are fully forward-looking people. And another part of the story really challenges the Israelites to do that. And, and Elizabeth, I think, did a great job of helping us to remember this story correctly in her children's moments. God says, I will provide. I will make provision for you. I, I hear your complaining. I hear your whining. And I'm a God who hears the prayers of the people, and I will provide. And so God provides provisions for the people. This famous manna that comes from heaven is provided by God. But as Elizabeth correctly identified, this provision is a daily provision. Uh, earlier in the service, we, we prayed the Lord's Prayer, which is a beautiful prayer Christ suggested to us to pray. And in that prayer, Jesus carefully referenced bread by saying, give us this day our daily bread. Remembering that Jesus is reminding us in the Lord's Prayer that bread needs to be given daily that it is not something that we can store up. And so what happens inevitably, and everyone knows this, even before Aaron read our passage of Scripture, we, we kind of know how Scripture is going to work. God's going to say, I'm going to provide bread every day. So every day I want you to go out and just gather the bread you need for that day. All right, so we hear that, and this is what goes in our minds. Someone is not going to follow that rule. <laughs> when we just... The second we hear scripture, we say, um, that's, that's a great rule. Someone's not going to do it. And sure enough, someone doesn't. Because someone gets in their minds, okay, I can beat this system. I'm going to go out on Monday, and I'll just gather the bread I need for the rest of the week. 
Now, if God wanted you to do that, God would have told you to do that. But we're going we're gonna to figure out how to beat God, right? So God says, do it, and then we're going to try and do it a different way. And sure enough, it doesn't work. <laughs> and, you know, this is kind of the, the next part of the message for today is this sense of being able to not be people that are backward-looking and not living in nostalgia are people that are forward-looking, and those people, believe it or not, they're living every single day fully in the day. Now, before we had, you know, COVID in our world, we used to set a church calendar that went for an entire year in front of us. I mean, we would be like, on this date, we're going to do that. On this date, we're going to do this. And then COVID hit. And all of a sudden, it was like, we just had to cancel the entire year. And all of a sudden, we were like, well, what do we do now? Well, we started having to plan events one week in advance under the contingency that something hadn't, wasn't going to change. And a lot of times, things did change. And a lot of those events actually had to be then canceled or rescheduled. And all of a sudden, I think it was a big eye-opener to us in at least the church and maybe you sitting at home with your schedules, that all of a sudden we weren't able to just act like the future was a known commodity. It wasn't something that we could just schedule out months and years in advance. Everything had to be reduced back into give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day whatever God is going to provide for us. You know, earlier I mentioned about our trek campers trekking off into the woods, and a lot of them maybe on their very first backpacking trip. And we would uh, say to the, the campers, you know, here's the things you should put in a backpack. Here's the things you're going to need for this hiking trip. And we would uh, kind of review that with them and explain to them why they should bring these, these various items. And they would nod their heads, and they would head off to their tents. And inevitably, they would show up to get ready to leave for the backpacking trip, and you would look at their backpacks, and they would be absolutely full. And you'd be like, hmm, I wonder what's in that backpack. So we're out there, you know, hiking along, and the kid who has all these things in that backpack, of course, it's this heavy backpack, and they're walking, and what are they doing? They're whining, and they're complaining, right? Because they've stuffed all this stuff in their pack that we asked them not to stuff in their pack. Because this is what we do. We say, okay, if I'm going on a long journey, I'm going to then take additional things just in case, maybe. I'm going to gather a little extra bread in case I wake up tomorrow morning a little bit late. And we call that hoarding, right? We're going to hoard. We're going to hold on to. We're going to micromanage. When God has said so clearly, that is exactly what I don't want you to do. Don't think that you can micromanage your future by putting more junk in a backpack, because guess what? It's going to get very, very heavy. So we're doing the same thing in so many ways, you know, where we are just storing up, hoarding, holding on to, instead of just having a sense that God will provide. You know, so often we can take a story like this and we can try to summarize the message. So we're going to summarize the message simply to say, okay, Dan's message this morning was do not whine and complain. And in a sense, that's kind of not the message. Because God doesn't shame the Israelites for whining and complaining. And matter of fact, because of their whining, we're told back in the second chapter of Exodus that the whole Movement from, fr- from slavery to freedom happened because the Israelites were whining and complaining. And Moses is given this text message from God to say, I hear the complaining of my people, and I want you to go and set them free. God hears our prayers. God hears our whining. God hears our complaining. The problem is, and I think the core message is, that we spend a lot of time whining and complaining, not to God, but to one another, to other people around us, beside us, and we make life very difficult for those people when we should be whining and complaining to God. When we whine and complain to God, then God provides what we need. God gives us our daily bread. When we whine and complain to others, we make life miserable. A lot of our Bible, believe it or not, is people whining and complaining. 
And we call that Holy Scripture in the form of many of our Psalms. So whining and planning has its place. It just has to be directed to God with the intention of knowing that God hears our prayers and God provides for us. The last thing I want to say this morning is the necessity of waking up in the morning and knowing that if God says he's going to provide manna, that he's going to provide manna. So when you get up in the morning, you trust in the Lord. You know and trust that if God says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. And so often we find ourselves when we're in a mode of complaining that we are not in a mode of trusting in the Lord. God will provide. Give us this day our daily bread. And the Israelites went out and there was the bread provided by God which allowed them to move forward on their journey. Still a difficult journey and still many setbacks on that long journey. But God walking along with the people. All these years later, we are in a wilderness situation as a nation right now. And I surely think that if we wanted to walk away from today's sermon, we would be in a stance of saying, wow, in a way, we're all in the wilderness. And we're all in a situation where we can do a lot of whining and complaining. But again, as from Scripture, we recognize that God hears our prayers. And so I hope that we'll all walk away trusting in a greater trust of the Lord that God will provide. Amen. As we gather at this table, it's no surprise that we remember this Last Supper with bread. And do you think it's just a coincidence that Jesus took bread and broke it? No, no. Jesus, as he holds this bread, is remembering this story and many others just like it of God's provision in the wilderness. So here we are again in this wilderness time. And we find ourselves holding bread, which Christ has provided for us. And we hope that this bread will give us the encouragement to move our journey, just as Jesus is encouraging us that I will be with you in this bread. Would you pray with me? For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and blessed it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We hold this common cup, and it is the cup of all of us, and it is offered to everyone at the table. So I hope that as Christ hands you this cup, that you will take a sip of it, and that you will receive this life-giving nourishment that Jesus provides. Would you pray with me? In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of Every Sunday, we remind ourselves of our giving and how important it is to continue to support our church financially, to continue to share what we've been given, our resources, our gift from God, and we share those resources with our world through our giving and through our support of our church. Thank you for everyone's continued support, 
and let us continue to bless these offerings that we receive today. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Our closing hymn as we pause to sing together. Jesus calls us o'er the tumult. Jesus is above so much of what we face in our modern world, and we give thanks for his walking beside us. So let us join together as we sing our closing hymn. This amazing story of people so long ago wandering in a wilderness. And yet we find ourselves so often in our lives wandering, wondering, feeling a sense of nostalgia for the way things once were, struggling to be fully in the moment and to trust in the Lord in our future. So Lord, this is our story. It is everyone's story. So Lord, help us as we find ourselves in these unique and challenging times to be trusting that you will provide to not hoard and think that we can somehow manage our own lives, but to come to you, Lord, every day, day by day, knowing that you are the God who is with us on this journey of life. And we give thanks that as we go through this journey, we have Christ who walks with us. And we pray in the power of his name. Amen. Please join us in singing the Spirit song.